We've got one more key concept in front of us, and that's inflation. And then we're going to connect a few dots at the end. Most of us think of inflation as rising prices, but that's not quite right. Imagine if an apple and an orange are a dollar each one year, but ten dollars each next year. Since you enjoy eating apples and oranges the same in one year as the next, then the only thing that's truly changed here is your money, which has declined in value. Inflation is not caused by rising prices. Rising prices are instead a symptom of inflation. Inflation is caused by the presence of too much money in relation to goods and services. What we experience are things going up in price, but in fact inflation is really the value of your money going down, simply because there's too much of it around. Here's an example. Suppose you're on a life raft and somebody has an orange that they are willing to sell for money. Only one person in the raft has any money, and that's a single dollar. So the orange sells for a dollar. But wait, just before it sells, you find a $10 bill in your pocket. Now, how much do you suppose the orange sells for? That's right, 10 bucks. It's still the same orange, right? Nothing about the utility or desirability of the orange has changed from one minute to the next. Only the amount of money kicking around in the raft. So we can make this claim. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. And what's true within a tiny life raft is equally true across an entire nation. Here, let me illustrate this point by using a long sweep of U.S. history. What we're looking at here is a graph of price levels in the United States that begins on the left in 1665 and progresses more than 300 years to 2008 on the right. But at this moment, only inflation over the period from 1665 to 1776 is marked on this chart. On the y-axis, what is being charted are price levels, not the rate of inflation. Now you might ask, how can we compare prices in 1665 to 2008? While there are some obvious liberties that have to be taken here, what is being compared are the basics of life. People ate food in 1665, just as they did later on. People had to transport themselves. They got educations, and they lived in houses in 1665, just as they did in 1776. So what is being compared is the relative cost of living in one period to the next. That is, inflation. In 1665, the basic cost of living was set to a value of 5. Now what is most striking about this chart to me is that from 1665 to 1776, there was absolutely no inflation. For 111 years, a dollar saved was, well, a dollar saved. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where you could earn $1,000, put it in a coffee can in the backyard, and your great-great-grandchildren could dig it up and enjoy the same benefits from that $1,000 as you would have 111 years previously. This isn't some fantasy from a cheap novella. This was reality in our country at one time. The country was on a gold and silver standard during this period and advanced tremendously while enjoying near-perfect price stability during times of peace. However, along comes a war, the Revolutionary War. And the country found itself unable to pay for the war with the gold and silver in the treasury. So a paper currency, called Continentals, was printed. And at first it was fully backed by a specified amount of real gold and silver in the treasury. But then the war proved to be more expensive than thought, and more and more of these were printed. Then the British, aware of the corrosive effects of inflation on society, started counterfeiting and distributing vast amounts of bogus Continentals, and soon the currency began to collapse. Before long, massive inflation took hold. Seen on the inflation chart, the Revolutionary War took the general price level from a reading of 5 to a reading of 8. After the war, the paper continentals were utterly rejected by the people, who strongly preferred gold and silver. Most interestingly, price levels promptly returned back to the pre-war levels. The next serious bout of inflation was also associated with the war, again due to the overprinting of paper currency, and again, upon conclusion of the war, we saw a relatively prompt return of prices to the pre-war levels, where they stayed for an additional 30 years. By now, we are nearly 200 years into this chart, and we find that the cost of living is roughly the same as it was in 1665. But then a war came along, the Civil War this time, and it was a doozy. To finance the war, the North had to resort to printing a type of currency that still lends its name to our own currency today. Of course, back then, it really did have a green back. Again, we see a rapid rise of inflation as a direct consequence of war, and again, a return to baseline after the crisis is over. We are now 250 years into this story, and the cost of living is still roughly the same as it was at the start. I invite you to think about that for a minute.
But then another war came along, and this one was even bigger than any before, and again it was a highly inflationary event. And then another war, even bigger than any before it, which again proved inflationary, but this time, something odd happened. Inflation did not retreat before the next war began. Why? Two reasons. First, the country was no longer on a gold standard, but instead a fiat paper standard, administered by the Federal Reserve, and the populace did not have another form of currency to which it could turn. And second, because this was the first time that the war apparatus was not dismantled upon conclusion of hostilities. Instead, full mobilization was maintained and a protracted Cold War was fought, certainly as inflationary a conflict as any shooting war ever was. And now, if we look at the entire sweep of history, we can make an utterly obvious conclusion. All wars are inflationary. Why is this? Because any time the government engages in deficit spending, it creates the conditions for inflation. However, when the deficit spending is on legitimate infrastructure, such as roads or bridges or schools, that investment will slowly pay for itself by boosting productivity and paving the way for the creation of additional goods and services that will someday soak up the extra cash. Wars, however, are special. Vast quantities of money are spent on things that are meant to be blown up. The money stays at home while the goods get sent off to be blown up. When a bomb blows up, there's no residual benefit to the domestic economy later on. This means war spending is the most inflationary of all spending. It's a double whammy. The money stays behind working its evil magic, while the goods it produced are destroyed. Heck, even if the goods aren't blown up, there's practically zero residual economic benefit to such specialized hardware, as amazing as that technology may be. For some reason, the most recent pair of wars have been presented by the U.S. mainstream press as being relatively pain-free for the average citizen, despite overwhelming historical odds to the contrary. In fact, on this 15-year-long chart of commodity prices, we observe that prices bounced in a channel, marked by the green lines, for more than 10 years. However, and hopefully by now unsurprisingly, shortly after the start of the Iraq War, commodity prices began marching higher and have inflated nearly 140% in five years. Your gasoline and food bills will confirm this. So if anybody tries to tell you that you haven't sacrificed for the war, let them know you sacrificed a large portion of your savings and your paycheck to the effort. Thank you very much. At any rate, back to our main story. Here's inflation between 1665 and 1975. Knowing what you now know about Nixon's actions on August 15, 1971, what do you suppose the rest of the graph looks like between 1975 and today? This is your world. You've been living on the steeply rising portion of this graph for so long that it probably looks like level ground to you. Because inflation is now a permanent feature, and because it advances at a percentage rate, your money is declining in value exponentially. That's what this hockey stick graph is telling you. What does it mean to live in a world where your money loses value exponentially? You know what it means, because you live there. It means always having to work harder and harder just to stay in place. And it means perplexing and astoundingly risky investment decisions have to be made in an attempt to grow one's savings fast enough to avoid the ravages of inflation. It means two incomes are needed where one used to suffice, and kids left at home while both parents work. A world of constantly eroding money is a devilishly complicated world to navigate, and leaves scant room for error, especially for those without the appropriate means or connections. And it doesn't have to be this way, and indeed for the majority of our country's history, as you can see, it wasn't. And I'm hard-pressed to say that inflation is a necessity and serves some essential and greater good because a lot of progress and advancement happened between 1665 and 1940 without the benefit of perpetual inflation. To help put all of this in context, let's mark the moments when our country abandoned the gold standard, first internally and then completely. It may have surprised some of you, as it did me, to find out that inflation is not a mysterious law of nature like gravity, but rather an extremely well-characterized matter of policy. So now we have our fifth key concept. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Flipped a bit, we can say that inflation is a deliberate act of policy. Here's what one wag had to say about this matter. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value. Zero. That was Voltaire in 1729. Of course, he was a bit too pessimistic in his assessment as this German woman proves by using her furnace to liberate the intrinsic heat content of paper money. John Maynard Keynes, the father of the branch of economics that utterly dominates our lives, had this to say about inflation. Lenin was certainly right. There is no more positive or subtle or sure means of destroying the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. 
by a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of the citizens. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economics on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Given that the destructive, corrosive effects of inflation are so well understood by the architects and the administrators of our monetary system, it's fair to wonder exactly what the plan here is. Now, finally, here in Chapter 10 of the Crash Course, we can string together these three very important dots. Number one, in 1971, the U.S., and by extension the world, terminated the last connection to a gold restraint, and federal borrowing turned the corner never to look back. Concurrently, the money supply turned the corner, piling up at a much faster rate than the growth of goods and services. And so we get to data point number three, which is that inflation is the fully predictable outcome of data points one and two. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. All connected, all saying the same thing, with profound implications for your future. Now, if you're of a mind that there's no reason that all three of these graphs cannot just continue to exponentially accelerate to ever higher amounts without end, then there's no point in watching the rest of the crash course. However, if you don't happen to believe that, then you're going to want to see the rest of this. There is literally nothing more important for you to be doing right now than gaining an understanding of how these pieces fit together, assessing the risks for yourself, and taking actions to prepare for the possibility of a future that's substantially different from today. Now that we've covered compounding, money, and inflation, you have the tools to get the most from the remaining sections of the crash course. We have a few more dots to connect. Let's go.